Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. Lance Fortnow received his PhD in applied mathematics from MIT. He currently chairs the School of Computer Science of the College of Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology and holds an adjunct professorship at the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. Previously, he was a professor at Northwestern University and the University of Chicago, a senior research scientist at the NEC Research Institute, and a Fulbright scholar in the Netherlands. His research focuses on computational complexity and its applications to economic theory. Fortnow authored the popular science book, The Golden Ticket, P, NP, and the Search for the Impossible. Lance, welcome to Data Skeptic. Hi, thanks for having me. So your book, The Golden Ticket, P, NP, and the Search for the Impossible, is a really good read for someone knowledgeable in computer science, for sure. But I think it's an especially good read for someone that doesn't know the field very well and wants to understand the problem. I think it would be hopeless to try and describe, I don't know, subgraph isomorphism to the average person on the street. Mm -hmm. But in contrast, I think, you know, the average person can really understand the ideas from your book. In the, the spirit of that accessibility, could you kick us off by a discussion of, you know, what is the P versus NP problem? problem. Okay. Well, I usually like to start thinking about Facebook because I think that's a great example. You know, you have some friends in Facebook. You can think about a clique of friends, you know, a group of people, all of whom are friends with each other. And then you could say, well, what's the largest clique in Facebook? Are there a hundred people in, on Facebook, who all of whom are friends with each other? And of course you can't find that out because you don't have access to Facebook's data, but suppose you worked at Facebook mm -hmm. and then you, you, so you had full access to all their data and you wanted to try to find the answer to this question. And now how would you do it? How would you do it algorithmically? One idea is you can look at every group of a hundred people and then see if they're all connected to each other, if they're all friends with each other. But the amount of groups of a hundred people and all the wall of Facebook is just way too big to even hope to do that in some reasonable time, even on Facebook's powerful uh, computers. Mm -hmm. Is there a faster way? Is there some smarter way? I don't know how, but maybe there's some smart algorithm that would somehow find a faster way of finding uh, this group of 100 people, all of whom are friends with each other. And the answer is we don't know. Whether or not there's some quick algorithm to do this is really the heart of the PNMP problem. The idea is that if I told you what the 100 people were, you could check relatively quickly. They're about 10,000 different pairs of people among the 100, 100 people. So you could quickly check if I told you which 100 people were friends, whether or not they were all friends with each other. But trying to find that group of 100 seems very, very difficult. This is just one of many, many similar kinds of sort of search problems that all fit into this NP category. What the P and NP problem really is saying is, is there some efficient way that if you have this, this kind of problem where you can check if your solution is, is easy, uh, is there a way to find a solution quickly? And the really neat thing about it is this Facebook, this problem about finding clicks in Facebook is as hard as any other search problem. If you can solve it for Facebook, you can solve any of these other problems. That's what makes this question really fascinating is, you know, either you have solutions for all of them or you have solutions for none of them. Is there some quick algorithm to find, to find uh, uh, how, to, how to solve the click problem? If we were to take jobs at Facebook and your job was to find the cliques and mine was to check them, that sounds pretty good for me. But of course, it requires you to be very clever in, in coming up with those and we don't have an algorithm to do it. What are your options? Do you just have to brute force try everything? Really? At, at this point, I mean, there are a few tricks you could try to do. But for the most part, yeah, you pretty much you have to brute force. I mean, one thing you could do, for example, is, you know, if someone doesn't have 100 friends, they're not going to be part of a group where everyone's mm -hmm. friends with each other. So you can throw out all the people who don't have a lot of friends. But I think the average number of friends is a couple hundred on Facebook. So that doesn't throw out too many. So you can do a few tricks to kind of reduce the space a little bit. But as far as we know, the best thing you can do is basically search all the possibilities. Uh, it's something we just don't know how to solve. So Facebook's an interesting one because it's a real world use case. They're definitely facing problems like this and they're going to either not be able to solve clique problems uh, or, or maybe they have to approximate them in some way. Are there other noteworthy industries or problems people might know where NP is affecting you know, tangible things people are working on from an industry perspective? 
Well, the problem connects with almost any kind of optimization kind of questions you ask. For example, when you're designing a car and you want to minimize the, the amount of drag, we have some scientific ways that seem to do reasonably well, and we end up doing a lot of testing in wind tunnels. But is there some mathematical way to come up with exactly the best way to minimize drag, you know, given some parameters that you have? Or, you know, when it comes to machine learning, here's another example. When it comes to machine learning, which is becoming such an important part of everything a lot of companies are doing these days, it's still right now, you know, a lot, there's a lot of math in there, but still a lot of sort of art to get the right kind of uh, uh, machine learning techniques. And even then, we're still from far from the ideal in what we can learn. If you can actually solve these kind of NP problems quickly, you can come up with much better, much more uh, efficient machine learning algorithms. If there were quick solutions, and to be honest, my guess is there aren't, but there really are quick solutions to these problems, it, w it would be a real game changer for just about everything. I'm going to refer people to – it's chapter two or three of your book. I can't recall, but it's sort of the – Oh, chapter two, right, The Beautiful World. Yeah, it, it's a great deep dive into what would the world look like if, in fact, we found out that P equals NP. And there's a lot of surprising things. Yeah, we, we cure cancer. I think that's the biggest one, or at least I would hope. The point is, is that when I talk to um, people working in the field, their challenges are really algorithmic. They need to find a ways that how the DNAs – cause proteins to form and how can you create proteins that block the cancer cells from forming without blocking other things from forming. If you were able to solve these problems algorithmically, you could really uh, very likely be able to solve diseases like cancer. You sort of individualize medicine very quickly. Yeah, I was reading some things recently. I don't claim to have a deep understanding of this, but geneticists need aspects of not theory to do some of their work. And not theory has a lot of surprising, at least to me, overlaps with complexity theory. And there's a lot of algorithmic problems. Yet that seems so distant on the surface. When people get in situations like that who aren't computer scientists, how do they find their way to realizing they have a computational problem and learning the background or, or the collaborators that can help them make some progress? Well, it's really neat these days. If you, if you go to Google and you search for NP completeness or maybe Google Scholar, so you look at research papers, and it's amazing how many papers you see come up that are from biology or chemistry or physics or economics. You know, we've gotten to this point where people realize that this is a significant barrier towards solving the problems they need to solve. I don't think they necessarily fully understand Exactly. But they know they know enough that they can show that this kind of problem is one of these hardest problems, you know, in NP, one of these hardest search problems, and that it's unlikely we're going to solve it, and that we need to find some other approach to deal with the problem, uh, maybe some good heuristic or some approximation or something, or just do the best we can do. So I certainly would love to see a cure for cancer. It would truly be a beautiful world if P equaled NP. What would it take mm -hmm. to prove that? Well, first, as I say, I, I think it's actually unlikely to be true, it seems. I don't know. I just don't believe the world can be so nice. <laughs> it seems like the world is very complex in these kinds of problems. It seems unlikely it'll have quick solutions. But the proof equals NP, you really just need to find an algorithm. You need to take one of these problems, like uh, the Facebook clique problem, or one of the other NP-complete problems, sort of like a, you know, coloring a map. Can you color a map in three colors so that every neighboring countries have different uh, colors? And there's loads of other kinds of, of NP problems. If you could just find an algorithm that solves one of these problems quickly, that would, that would show you P equals NP. So, of course, the challenge is trying to find such an algorithm, especially because I don't think such an algorithm exists. It'd be, uh, so it'd be really surprising if you find one. Yeah, we do have a lot of people working on problems where they would benefit from this. And as, as so far, no one's yet have produced, even in some obscure NP complete problem, a, a viable, efficient way to do it. I know that doesn't prove that P doesn't equal NP, but it certainly says something about how hard it is, I'm sure. Yeah, not only has anyone not found a very efficient algorithm, people even haven't found algorithms that do much better than, you know, basically searching the whole space. I mean, often you can cut it down a little bit. For, for the most part, we don't seem to have uh, algorithms that do significantly better than brute force. What are your thoughts on the emergence of, uh, I believe it would be called a constructive proof? Someone says, it must be the case that P equals NP, but I can't tell you the algorithm that does it. It must be the case that, oh, sorry, can you repeat sure. that? Uh, it, someone could prove that uh, it's certainly true that P equals NP without producing um, an actual efficient algorithm. They would just show that such an efficient algorithm would have to exist, even though they don't know what it is. I suppose that's possible. 
that you could come up with a proof that would kind of show that there's an algorithm without showing that it exists. There are some tricks that you can actually, at least in theory, turn that into an efficient algorithm because in some sense you could try all algorithms. So it's not very efficient, but it's something you could, you could actually do. He has a neat trick by Levin. You know, basically you try the first program half the time, you try the second program a quarter of the time, try the third program an eighth of a time. Whatever correct program you have, will uh, you'll, you'll find a solution. But, you know, that, that's actually a nice theoretical result in practice that doesn't really work well. But if, you know, I'd be surprised if we, if at least, I mean, it's pretty, that happens pretty rarely. It's really, it's really rare we have examples of where you show an algorithm exists for a problem without actually producing the algorithm. Mm-hmm. That would be really kind of it's surprising. I mean, more likely is maybe I get some algorithm and, and the algorithm works, but the only way you could prove the algorithm works if, say, the Riemann hypothesis were true. Mm-hmm. Or some crazy thing like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Where uh, one could imagine that. But like I said, I don't think anything that these things are going to happen because my, my guess is really that we don't have an algorithm at all. Yeah, uh, that seems to be the consensus and something that if I had to put my money down where I would place it too. You know, I recall sitting through a lecture once where the professor said something like, people have been working on P versus NP for several decades. We haven't solved it, but at least we figured out a few ways that we aren't going to solve it. At the time, I thought this was hilarious because I had a vision of this, you know, disheveled researcher giving up after 30 or 40 years of trying to solve the problem a certain way and saying, well, I guess you can't solve it that way when in actuality, maybe someone more clever could have come around and used the same techniques and been successful. Failure doesn't really prove anything. Thankfully, I eventually learned that this wasn't a joke at all. Uh, I was wondering if you could help me understand, you know, what does it mean to say we've learned how we won't be able to solve a problem? I think the initial attempts at trying to settle the P versus NP problem came out of the standard tricks that we use in uh, computation, which is um, what we call simulation and diagonalization. So basically what you want to try to do is you want to simulate all possible algorithms and then change the answer at the end to prevent that algorithm from being correct. There are a lot of techniques. There are a lot of results we do can show in, in complexity that kind of work along those lines. Those kinds of results all work even when you add um, sort of extra information that every machine can access, like extra black box information. And if every machine has access to that black box information, uh, all these proofs would still go through. What three researchers, uh, Baker, Gill, and Solovey, showed in the 70s was, well, no, no black box kind of proof like this could possibly work to settle the P versus NP problem. So these kinds of techniques that we were using to settle complexity theory problems just wouldn't be able to work. Those techniques that were, that were done at the time would not be able to work to settle P versus NP. would have to find something different. You know, and then people have found other kinds of techniques. There's some techniques based on circuits trying to show that if a problem has, you know, if you can show a, a problem has a very large circuit, a lot, you need a lot of ands and or gates mm-hmm. and not gates to solve it then that's a way to show that P doesn't equal NP. People have gotten very small results along those lines, but now we also have some evidence that those kinds of proofs will also be difficult to do in the, you know, to, to, to settle the broad question of P and NP. And then there's been some algebraic techniques which don't seem to, which seem to avoid the black box issues, but those also, we found some evidence that that's not gonna work as well. So um, right now, I, you know, generally, in fact, what I generally tell people is we're further away from P versus NP than we ever, ever were in the sense that we really don't seem to have any obvious directions that seem they're going to get us there. The latest direction a couple of years ago started by uh, Katan Momoli at University of Chicago. He has this notion of way of doing it uh, using algebraic geometry. So he has an approach based on you know, very deep mathematical problems. But even there, it it seems it's going to be very difficult for him to uh, make this program succeed, uh, if at all. And I would probably say it's not looking likely he's actually going to settle the P versus NP problem right now. You know, really, uh, I think if we're going to solve the P versus NP problem, it's really going to take some technique that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, I've been really fascinated by these barrier results that that you were describing and I think we've covered the three major ones I'm aware of. Do you think we're going to uncover more barriers in the future? Is it just going to be barriers all the way down? Barriers all the way down. 
I think well, probably people will find some techniques and then people will find reasons why those techniques will fail. And then eventually, with hope, I mean, we'll, we'll solve it. You know, there's this great analogy of, you know, Fermat's last theorem. You know, A to the N plus B to the N equals C to the N doesn't happen for positive A, B, and C with N at least three. That uh, was open for a long time and was one of those problems when I was a kid that every math-oriented kid always dreamed of solving mm-hmm. someday. People come up with techniques and people would show these techniques could not work. But then eventually, you know, Andrew Weil was actually in the 90s, actually solved the problem. People built up techniques and then eventually actually showed that Fermat's last theorem was actually true, gave a real proof of it. So there's hope. I mean, that took several hundred years. You know, P versus NP is only 46 years old now, right? 1971. So there's a long way to go. On, uh, we, we, have, we haven't been around that long. So one would hope that, you know, 50 years from now, we'll create these incredible new techniques and maybe someone will start making real progress and that eventually we'll actually get there to a nice proof. I'm getting skeptical it'll happen in my lifetime, but I think we'll get there eventually. Let's say a proof did emerge. Um, actually, proofs often emerge, just none that have uh, uh, proven out to be correct. And, and I think that's part of the challenge. A lot of the proofs people present, it takes a high level of expertise to understand. We can almost say that any proof is going to have to be pretty technical because this is a non-trivial problem. If you could solve it in one page, uh, presumably maybe it would have been done already. What's the peer review process like? You know, if that proof that's submitted is correct, it's correct, you know, on the first day as much as it is 10 years later, how do we go through validating something that's very hard to validate? Now keep in mind that I typically get a P versus NP proof, I'd say on the average once a month. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, so uh, quite often. So it's not like, you know, I get one proof and then a year or every other year and say, wow, this is a great approach. Uh, most of them make the same similar mistakes. So often you can just quickly look at it. I mean, some of them just don't really understand the problem. So you can just say, oh, you know, they, they didn't really get the definitions right. Um, a lot of them kind of make this mistake of sort of saying, well, if an algorithm were to solve SAD, it would have to work this way. And the only and the only way it could work that way is if it took a long amount of time. But in fact, if the, the, the real issue is you don't know how an algorithm can work. You can't make any assumptions about the algorithm can work. The algorithm might not use any of the structure of the problem at all. It might do some crazy thing that doesn't even look related. I just happen to get the correct answer. And that's what you have to guard against. And so it's extremely difficult to show that kind of no algorithm can work. So these kinds of proofs to kind of say an algorithm has to work this way, generally it's easy to show those kinds of proofs don't work. I mean, often sometimes you'll get a lot of these papers where there is a big step missing. It's clear that the following must be true. And then, you know, you say, well, it's not so clear. You got to actually show it. <laughs> and then occasionally, and it's happened, you know, a handful of times, there'll be some paper coming out. Uh, you can't immediately dismiss it. And if you can't immediately dismiss it, all of a sudden people get excited by it, probably a little too excited. Uh-huh. And for a problem like P and NP, there really is no, you know, what will happen is if somebody, if someone, you know, sort of uh, someone reasonable in the field says that this has a potential chance of being true, all of a sudden people will descend on it. And what we've seen happening is there'll be a big discussion page, you know, it'll be web pages devoted to discussing all the issues in the paper and trying to, you know, trying to understand where the pieces are and how they fit together and whether this is a legitimate proof. So uh, I'm not so worried about the peer review. Once <laughs> this, this kind of problem is so big, once anyone even makes a claim and is willing to put that claim forward, Everyone will descend upon it and will analyze it. And, you know, I've seen even the top mathematicians of the world come. Like, you know, take, a, I mean, the big one from five, probably a little bit more, five to ten years ago, the D.L. Lally Alakar. He had this proof, and then a few bloggers said that there might be there might be something there. And then within a week, people were analyzing it. They were finding bugs, saying, well, we can fix this part. Can we fix that part? And it finally was put to rest by, uh, was Terry Tao, you know, probably the most famous mathematician of our generation, who finally found the place and said, listen, this is a place they can't, you know, here's where just the proof just falls apart and it can't be fixed. There's a standard sort of peer review that typically goes on for academic papers. But when you have something this famous, especially in a world, you know, we live in where everyone's connected and can download the paper, anyone can look and download the paper and analyze the paper and open, and open discussions, it'll happen like that. Yeah, makes sense. So it's even different than Wilds in the 90s. Wilds could work in secret. (laughs) 
announce its result. And, you know, people have still had to sort of send like, you know, there was no sort of central place where everyone was analyzing the proof. So I think it's even changed from the 90s. So let's assume that, you know, a paper was eventually accepted demonstrating that, in fact, P does not equal NP. What's most exciting for me is personally not so much the result maybe, but to go and study the techniques of that proof. Uh, as surely they'll be novel and they'll give us new ideas and they'll have further implications for what comes next. Is there a, a practical benefit to the world if the resolution arises and P does not equal NP? Is there any industry that immediately gets a benefit from that result? Let's take a break from our show this week to discuss our sponsor, Periscope Data. If you haven't heard about Periscope Data in one of their previous sponsorships, it's a web-based tool made for data teams, enabling them to turn SQL into beautiful interactive dashboards to share with their entire company. It's a great tool for teams of any size and has some features that are really beneficial for large organizations. Many of the data science teams I talk to have internal metrics they look at, but also have a slightly different set of metrics for non-technical team members, which are often more interpretable. With Periscope Data, it's easy to build and maintain different dashboards for different teams. Maybe the most picky executive needs their own personalized custom dashboard. No problem. Their SQL views make it easy to reproduce results and plot them different ways, and their custom filters can enable users to tweak the data they're looking at. Why not consider Periscope Data for your company? Start a free trial today by visiting periscopedata.com slash skeptics. Once again, that's periscopedata.com slash skeptics. Is there a, a practical benefit to the world if the resolution arises and P does not equal NP? Is there any industry that immediately gets a benefit from that result? Well, the biggest one is a lot of cryptography is based on hard functions. I mean, if, if, if say, P were equal NP, then public key cryptography is impossible. And that public key cryptography is really sort of what we need for e-commerce. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to your bank or you go to your uh, to Amazon, uh, on a web page, you want to buy things and you want everything to be nicely encrypted, like your credit card information. You really need a, a public key crypto system to do that. You know, P-nodical NP is not enough to prove that public key crypto exists, but it's definitely something that needs to happen for public key crypto to exist. So that would be a good sign. And then there's this notion that I think complexity is actually good for the world. It almost gives a kind of a bit of a friction, slows things down. I mean, what, you know, if you have a stock market where you can start predicting everything, I think it would just cause incredible swings. It would cause a lot of chaos. Having things be complex and hard to figure out, actually, I think, often make things work better. It's hard to explain why. But it's sort of like friction. It's like, you know, do you, you think, wow, a frictionless world would be so awesome. You know, it would be so much easier to use less energy. But in a frictionless world, we won't be able to walk. So I kind of view complexity as, as kind of a friction that slows things down. And when we eliminate complexity, it causes it can cause issues. It's friction for people with good intentions and bad intentions alike. Bad intentions as well, yeah. right? You know, it'd be a lot easier to hack into things. P where you go to NP. So you'd mentioned how public key crypto depends on the assumption that P does not equal NP. Seems pretty safe given how much has gone into trying to solve the problem, and no one's solved it. And most people who look at it conclude P probably doesn't equal NP. But when surveys are done, like you know, I know you've run some and there have been a lot of other informal ones as well, there's an option I see added sometimes. You know, Do you think P equals NP? Do you think P does not equal NP? Or do you think the question is ill-posed? And that answer has always had this sort of tantalizing thing to me because it, it just sounds like, a hey, maybe that could be it. But at the same time, it's I've always felt it was hand-wavy and I'm not quite sure I know what it means. What do you think of that as the possible outcome of the conjecture? Well, it's not ill-posed. I mean, there's a well-founded formal mathematical definition of P and NP that is out there. I don't think the question is ill-posed at all. There's, a, there's definitely a mathematical question either has an answer or doesn't have an answer. I mean, there is a question as to whether the P versus NP problem truly corresponds to efficient computation. You know, it's not an exact match because an efficient computation is a more, if you never, you know, is a... It's more. It doesn't have a formal notion. So, we, so mapping it to the P and NP question isn't, isn't an exact match. It's just kind of an approximation. But the P, you know, whether or not P equals NP is is just as well mathematically defined as you know Fermat's last theorem was mathematically defined. There is a question as to it's possible that there is no proof one way or the other that it's independent of the axioms of set theory. I think that's unlikely. It, it's almost like saying, okay, because we don't know how to do it now, we'll never know how to do it. 
that just seems like we're giving up. I mean, I think the techniques are out there. Well, we'll be out there. My fear of the P versus NP proof is that it will use some really deep ideas from some new mathematical field. Say I were to be put in a coma and wake up 100 years from now, and someone gave me the proof, my guess is I would not be able to understand it. I mean, take it like from SS theorem, as much as I dreamt of solving that problem, I can't understand the proof because I don't have the mathematical background it takes to understand that proof. And I'm guessing the same thing will happen with P and NP. There'll be a small number of people who develop this whole new mathematical field that doesn't even exist yet, and that'll be used to solve the proof. And then there'll be enough of those people around to verify that proof is correct, but the rest of us will just have to have a vague idea of how it works. With that in mind, uh, I, I'm guessing you would reject the claim that an outsider could come in and solve P versus NP. Is that correct? I would say it's very unlikely. These things happen, but they happen pretty rarely. And usually when these big problems do get solved, they get solved by someone who's an expert in the field. Mm -hmm. You never know. I mean, I don't want to eliminate the possibility. There are definitely a lot of outsiders who think they can solve the problem. That's why they <laughs> much. <laughs> but if you're an outsider working on it, you should really make sure you understand the problems. Make sure you understand, you know, what the P versus NP problem really is and that you're not just making the same mistakes a lot of other people are making. You're not making any assumptions about the algorithm works, how, how the algorithm works. You have to just make no assumptions about that and that all your math that you express is really well formulated and that if you write up a proof that it's, it's done in a way, you know, it's using terminology and done in a way that people can generally follow. And there aren't missing steps. I mean, you, you really have to sort of uh, figure these things out. The best way to convince someone, it's, it's harder for P not equal NP, but if you think you've proven P equals NP, the best way to convince someone is to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, mint yourself some Bitcoins. If, P, if you had a great P equals NP algorithm, you could just mint Bitcoins by the dozens <laughs> quickly. Yeah. Make it yeah. rich. Well, and then crash the entire system. So maybe just mint a couple of Bitcoins to prove that you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, that sort of thing. You know, um, you could break some, you know, there's large numbers. We don't know how to factor. If you could show how to factor them. There are contests out there for solving various empty complete problems. You can show how you could just solve them all quickly. If you can come up with an algorithm, it, that's probably the easiest way to convince people that, wow, I have an algorithm that solves all these problems. No one, at least that would get people, something get people interested. For p not equal empty, it's a little trickier because there's no sort of easy way to, to convince people that what you have might work. But just write it clearly. I mean, the ones that get looked at the best are the ones that look like there's something there, that look like they understand the problem and that they have some new approach. So if you can kind of describe what you are doing differently and describe that your approach, describe it well mathematically, that's the way to get people to, uh, to be interested in, in your proof. But I wouldn't recommend that people try to prove it because... You know, whatever you're thinking of doing, it was probably already thought of. There's lots of other interesting problems in computer science that I think are much more tractable and still extremely important that, uh, you know, you don't have to try to tackle the really big one. What about, I mean, even in complexity theory, I've always been on the lookout for interesting papers in a class NC, Nick's class, because with the way commodity hardware is going, it seems like there ought to be a revitalized interest in parallel algorithms. Do you think we can see, you know, it, maybe we have to let P versus NP be an elephant in the room? Are there other areas you think will blossom in complexity theory in the near future? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there's all sorts of great work going on. Yeah, we're still trying to understand. We've, we've, we've had, had these nice, neat ideas of checking, even showing that lots of problems, that are, are they hard to approximate? How hard is it to approximate certain kinds of problems? There's a long line of research that way. You know, so if you can't even solve it exactly, maybe you could solve it a little bit. You get answers that are close to perfect. In some cases, that seems to work. In some cases, we have limits. And then we're, we're really trying to understand uh, what those limits are. And there's some great questions there. There's been a lot of great work trying to eliminate randomness. There's a lot of mm -hmm. times when we can use randomness to try to solve a certain kind of problem, a randomized algorithm that seems to work. Or, um, or we want to construct something that you can do randomly. And we want to now, can we do it without the randomness? So there's been a lot of interesting uh, work done along those lines and a lot of uh, neat things happening. And then even showing that, you know, even if we can't solve P versus NP, we can look at weaker models of computation and show that those things don't work well. And so there's been a lot of work, you know, really interesting things that way. You know, well, 
maybe we can't solve P versus NP, but we can show other kinds of problems can't be solved quickly or, you know, whatever kind of model that we're using. So there's still work along those lines. And there's, there's lots of interesting things going on. There are other great open questions like, can we take every efficient algorithm and run it fast and parallel, as you mentioned? You know, the P versus NC problem. Yeah. You know, one great question, you know, even just an algorithmic question that, that, that people seem to be making progress on recently is the matching problem. The matching problem is uh, you take a bunch of people in Facebook and you want to match up people in pairs. So can you pair off, you know, so that each pair are friends? So take a bunch of people on Facebook, some even number of people. Can you pair off people into friendships? So we know how to do this efficiently and we know how to solve it in parallel on parallel computers if we have randomness. And the big question is, can we solve it in parallel computers if we don't have randomness? There's been some actually interesting progress even in the last few months that kind of leads us to admit we're getting very close to that. Oh, very cool. So that, that's oh, just a neat cool. question that should be tractable and hopefully it will fall. And there's still and there's lots of great questions out there. I mean, there's lots, lots of great work is being done in, in complexity and in theory of algorithms. You know, I mean, a big, big, big question is is machine learning is is the algorithms for machine learning don't have a strong theoretical basis. I mean, they seem to work really well in many cases, but we don't have a good theoretical understanding of why they work. And that would, I think, that's a great active research area to try to understand that, try to understand how these algorithms work, how do you interpret once you've learned something, trying to understand why. You know, what's going on, interpret why a, a trained machine learning model is actually doing what it's doing. So those are great questions as well. So there's, there's a lot of great things that are, are really challenging in our field that we're really trying to tackle. The P versus NP problem right now, and that's probably not going to get solved soon. But that doesn't mean there aren't so many more interesting things that are going on today. The machine learning uh, aspect is one that is especially interesting to me. Do you think that a lot of the interesting proofs that might be forthcoming are really because we haven't studied it, because machine learning hasn't been such a prominent thing? Or are there interesting issues that make it difficult to study machine learning? You know, maybe how stochastic it is, is problematic for analysis. Why don't we know more today? I think what's happened is, and it's not unrelated to even the P versus NP problem. You know, what's really happened to make machine learning work is really the computers have gotten a lot faster. We've gotten some better algorithms, but really it's the basis of these algorithms have been around for decades. What's happened is the computing power now lets us make them work. We're able to train uh, neural nets that have uh, several layers of depth in their circuits and the circuits, you know, in the, in, the, in the neural nets that we get. We don't really understand, even on a complexity viewpoint, how powerful these things are. How powerful is a neural net? that has several um, uh, layers in it. These seems to be, uh, you know, what you can do with these things are actually pretty complex. What happens with a single layer of neural net, you can kind of really understand. It's kind of just like a weighted average thing. But what happens when you do these things on top of each other, it just gets away to us. It, it becomes a very complex object and very hard to study. And so you have these algorithms that are training these nets, you know, that changing the weights to make these things work. But it, it yields something which is just incredibly difficult to analyze. And that's what the challenge is, trying to understand how do we analyze these things so that we understand you know, why, why they work so well and then hopefully someday be able to prove why they work so well. Well, to wind up, I thought I'd maybe give you a tricky question. It seems, as you've stated, that do you believe, as I do, that it's much more likely P does not equal NP. If you were to try and I don't know, upper or lower bound that, is there anything you would say that you believe is more likely than uh, the case that P turns out to be equal to NP? You know, is it more likely we'll find life on the moon? More likely that, uh, I don't know, is there some way we can set kind of an extreme uh, unlikeliness of uh, the result turning out to be that P equals NP? I don't know. It's not really like a probability thing. <laughs> it's hard uh -huh. to, you know, it's either, either it's true or it's not. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you put this one of, of extraterrestrial life, right? And that, that's, that's an interesting example, too, because mm -hmm. you can never prove that there's no extraterrestrial life out there. Right, yeah. I mean, one day we might find it, and then that'll be a proof that it exists. But they'll never be able to prove it doesn't exist. I mean, if, we're, if the only life that exists is here on Earth, we'll never be able to convince ourselves of that because, you know, there are galaxies so far away, we'll never have a chance to, to analyze them. In some sense, P and NP is sort of like that. P equals NP if there's some algorithm that exists. And trying to show P not equal NP means trying to show that there's no algorithm that's out there that'll work, that'll solve these problems. Now, hopefully there'll be some way to actually show that no algorithm can work. But right now, all, you're, all we can do is sort of whack-a-mole. People come up with new algorithms and we show they don't work. <laughs> I would have to say it's more likely that we'll, I mean, actually, I don't, 
I'm not a big believer that there is extraterrestrial life, but it seems more likely than that than the vehicle is empty. No, I think that's a great analogy on a several different levels, definitely. Anything you think we missed that we should be sure to touch on before I wind up? Oh, there's so much we missed. Well, of course, yeah. We didn't um, even talk about any XP not being an ACC. I'm sorry. I know we missed oh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's all those kind of neat results, kind of the partial results like, yeah. like that. There's all this wonderful world stuff like zero knowledge, like the yeah. fact that I can um, – uh, I mean, if I'm really powerful, I can convince you that there is, I say, a clique in Facebook. You'll be convinced that that clique exists, but you'll have no information about what that clique is. And I think that's just a powerful idea that's, that's proven it's very useful in cryptography. So you can do this with any kind of NP-like problem convince you that it exists without giving you any idea of how to find it, which is cool. There's even ways for me, if you can ask me random questions, that I can convince you that something doesn't exist. I can convince you that there is no, um, say, clique of a size 100. Uh, if it doesn't exist, I can actually convince you of that by having you ask me random questions if I'm extremely powerful. So there's all sorts of neat things we can do with MP that are very surprising. Complexity theory for me is just a wonderful area with a lot of interesting work, a lot of some very surprising work, some things that go the way you expect it, and, 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 and something we're still trying to explore. Computation, to me, is the biggest of all mysteries. I mean, it's, uh, it's you know, we, we build computer programs out of very simple instructions. Mm -hmm. And yet what it does and trying to understand what a computation can do and how to analyze it and what we can do quickly just becomes so, such complex questions to try to an understand and analyze. You know, I work in a topic where we're excited about what we can understand, but we're extremely humbled by what we can't uh, understand. And there's a lot more of that. There's a lot more we don't know how to show or don't know how to prove than, than what we can prove. And so um, that's the exciting field to, uh, uh, to be a part of. Well, of course, for uh, listeners who share that excitement or, or maybe need a push in that direction, because I certainly share the excitement, of course, I'm going to recommend once again the Golden Ticket, your book. There'll be a link in the show notes. They can get it at Amazon and all those places as well. Maybe after they graduate that, they get onto your advisor, Michael Sipser's book, where I learned, or perhaps we should get them a Georgia Tech application. Well, what are their options? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of, um, yeah, you really get excited. It's a neat part of computer science trying to understand, you know, sort of the basic nature of why, of how computation works, what we can and what we can't do. You know, I always love to get new people involved in, in trying to help with these questions. It's been a growing field. And computer science itself has just been extremely exciting over the last, uh, especially in the last uh, 15 years or so. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, there's some other great books, you know, as you want to. I mean, there's uh, Avi Wigderson just came out with a book draft. He's one of the famous complexity theorists. Mm -hmm. It's a very mathematical uh, introduction to the field, but it really kind of overviews a lot of what's been going on in complexity. So that's definitely worth a read. And then there's a nice textbook by um, Sanjay Varor and Boaz Barak. But again, that's kind of meant for graduate students, you know, people who've already kind of done the math. Sure. And then there's Scott Aronson um, has another has, has his own book about quantum computing, quantum computing since the age of Democrates. I'm not yep. saying that right. That's also kind of a, of an interesting read, a little bit different than my book, but uh, he kind of focuses. Uh, it's, it's almost like a philosophical uh, jaunt through the uh, through a lot of these questions. Yeah, great recommendations. If you're really interested, just, uh, just oh, and you know, feel free to check out my blog and Twitter. <laughs> You know, we talk about a lot, lots of interesting things is there as well. I'll link to both in the show notes. Well, Lance, thank you so much again. This was a real pleasure getting a chance to chat with you and share some of the, these topics with the listeners. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 